Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com for premium picks, DwyerSportsBetting.com. Look us up on Roku or in the sports section, Dwyer Boxing and Sports News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Let's go around the world of boxing. I'm going to highlight three or four stories. Just something to keep an eye out on. Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. There's a very disturbing video on YouTube. It's Freddie Roach discussing the upcoming Mike Alvarado Richland Povotnikov fight. And in the video, Freddie Roach actually says that he only saw Chavez Jr. five times before his last fight. This is the fight before the Brian Vera fight. In other words, one of the biggest fights in the middleweight division in several years. Right? Chavez Jr. against Sergio Martinez. And Roach says that he saw Chavez Jr. five times before that fight. And that, um, you know, Chavez Jr. knocked the guy down, Sergio Martinez, in the 12th round, but couldn't finish. Well, understand that just shows you the lack of seriousness and the lack of preparation, if it's true, that Chavez Jr. had before arguably the biggest fight of his career. Right? Well, now Chavez Jr. appears to be moving on to a new trainer, Robert Garcia. Let's call it what it is. Right? Freddie Roach, in essence, is firing. Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. Roach has other championship fighters, including Manny Pacquiao, Miguel Cotto, Ruslan Pavotnikov, many others. They're only 24 hours in a day. Roach clearly had higher priorities than to be in Chavez Jr.'s corner for his last fight against Brian Vera. As you recall, Chavez Sr. was in the corner with other people. Well, now Chavez Jr. is considering new trainers and apparently seems to be moving on to Robert Garcia. Let me also say, too, there's an article on BoxingScene.com where Chavez Jr. claims that he can still make 160. Chavez Jr. is kidding himself. If you're a serious gambler, you need to start fading Chavez Jr. right now. He's been in the game a long time. He clearly doesn't have the discipline in terms of training, keeping himself at weight, showing up to the gym, even for big fights, that hungry fighters do, right? In other words, if you remember the movie, you know, Rocky, he's the guy who, you know, has had success, who's let that success go to his head, and now doesn't have the dedication, doesn't have the hunger of an up-and-coming fighter. Let me also point out, too, that there's a big difference, and I mean huge, between 160 and 168. You got different personality types at 168. The guys are not just eight pounds bigger, but you need to view it as a different country. I don't believe a middleweight champ like Peter Quillen could survive at 168. The guys are too savvy, right? They're highly technical. Andre Ward, Carl Frotch, Marco Parabin, Sakio Bika. You're not going to enter the ring and outthink these guys or push them around. All of the four guys I just named, in my opinion, would clean Chavez Jr.'s clock, especially this Chavez Jr., who's not the fighter he once was. He doesn't have the volume. He doesn't move around the ring. Let's get real, too. If he drains himself to get back to 160, we already know... He's not going to outbox Sergio Martinez. 
right? His only shot in any rematch with Martinez is a puncher's chance. He did put Martinez down in the 12th round. But that's really all he can do. Get lucky on a punch, right? He certainly doesn't have the boxing skills at this point in his career to outbox him. I would question Chavez Jr.'s chances against Gennady Golovkin. So, my point is, don't be fooled by the big name. A lot of guys have reputations based on past performance, not their present abilities. Whatever Chavez Jr. has done in the past, in my opinion, you need to be a skeptic of his career going forward, right? He had a world-class trainer in Freddie Roach. Apparently, he's going to another world-class trainer, Robert Garcia. But the point isn't the trainer. The point is whether the fighter actually has the dedication to actually go through a rigorous training camp. I don't think he does. Let's shift gears. Tyson Fury. Now, longtime subscribers know I'm actually bullish on Tyson Fury. I think in the ring, this man has few peers, right? I think he's an elite heavyweight. I know Lennox Lewis said that he feels he could knock out Tyson Fury inside of a round. Rest assured that if Lennox Lewis backs away from the buffet table and enters the ring for the first time in more than a decade, I'd be rolling with Tyson Fury in that fight. But Tyson Fury, just in terms of his maturity or lack of maturity, doesn't seem ready for prime time. In other words, I think he could be a great fighter. But right now, the stage is too big for him. His Twitter tweets really do show, in my opinion, a guy with emotional highs and emotional lows. That instability, quite frankly, is something you need to consider. I don't believe a level-headed guy would be sending the tweets that Tyson Fury has sent, especially not a guy of his stature. Fury right now is one of the best heavyweights in the world. I expect more from great heavyweights than this, right? So Fury, all I can say is you need to consider the maturity. You need to consider the emotional highs and lows when you're dealing with Tyson Fury. I believe certain fighters show up to press conferences and play up the press conference with their tongue in their cheeks, right? They understand that boxing is entertainment. They want to play to the camera. They want to help the promoter sell tickets. They want to uh, play to their fan base. Uh, those guys get it, right? I believe David Hay is a guy who, you know, is perfect for the stage because he understands boxing tradition, he understands where the boundaries are. Tyson Fury does not, right? His lack of maturity, quite frankly, in my opinion, is jeopardizing his career, right? I'm going to overlook the tweets, but when it comes to gambling, you always have to consider the temperament of the fighter. You know, what are the odds that the guy's going to show up today and actually be himself? With Tyson Fury... There's a bigger question there than there is with most fighters. Let's shift gears a little bit. The other day, Floyd Mayweather showed up at a basketball game and sat next to one of the NBA greats, Kobe Bryant, and the two guys had a long conversation. I think that's an inspired pair. Right? Understand these guys have much more in common than meets the eye. First of all, they're both very, very fierce competitors, even by Hall of Fame standards. I don't believe a Kobe or a Floyd can fathom or envision ever being Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. In other words, these guys are the other side of the table, right? Whatever superstar talents these guys had, 
these guys have sought to maximize that talent. The idea of showing up five times before one of the biggest events of your athletic life. Um, the idea of having problems making weight for a fight that was scheduled months ago. The idea of having your own trainer questioning your dedication. That would never happen to a Kobe Bryant or a Floyd Mayweather. These guys are in the gym or in the ring working out, making sure that when the event starts, they are fully prepared, right? Understand these guys are starting from the position of, I've already put in the work. I'm prepared. If I have five days to prepare for this game or match, I'm going to spend those five days preparing for the game or match. Understand, too, that both of these guys had pro athletes as fathers. So that already places them in, you know, a very rare ear. And understand both of these guys have vastly exceeded their father's accomplishments. Think about it, right? You know, Kobe's dad was an NBA player. Let's just say Jelly Bean, Brian, wasn't the Hall of Famer that Kobe is, right? Floyd Mayweather's father, Floyd Sr., was a pretty good fighter. But he wasn't Floyd Jr. Now understand the dynamic. Both of these guys have also had strained relationships with their fathers. Both of these guys have gone through long periods of time in the past where they didn't speak with their fathers. Both of these guys later reconciled with their fathers, right? Both of these guys are suffering from chronic injuries that I don't think the public fully appreciates. It's not an issue because both of these guys are prepared, train very hard, and do things to compensate for the injuries. So, let's talk about Kobe's knee. That knee is so sketchy that Kobe leaves the country to get medical treatment on the knee. Think about it. Multimillionaire, very wealthy, certainly has health care here in the United States. And of course, the guy's leaving the country, right, to get treatment on his knee, exotic treatment, right, platelet treatment, that helps him perform. The one thing, though, that you never hear from Kobe, and I mean never, is him using the knee as an excuse. That's just not who he is. Right, so he's out there, win, lose, or draw, on a knee that requires treatment. And he'll never mention that knee as an excuse. That's just not how he's built. Rather, he's built the other way. The way where you get treatment and try to be your best, whatever the injury. Now, it's no secret that Floyd Mayweather, for years has had problems with his hands, right? His hands are not as strong as they once were. If you look at the build-up to the Mayweather-Canelo fight, you'll actually see that they have him in the ring against Guerrero. There comes a time where, after a round, he walks over to his corner and his father, the same father who he had problems with in the past, but who knows him, looks at him, and says, you hurt your hand, huh? And Mayweather just nods. In other words, this is an open secret. Mayweather gets treatment on his hands. But here again, in pre-fight buildups and stuff like that, Mayweather offers no excuses for his hands. Like Kobe, he's a guy who, behind the scenes, does what he needs to do to get ready for a fight. His hands are not an excuse in his eyes, right? He's going to do what it takes to be ready. Neither Kobe nor Floyd is in their 20s. These are guys in their 30s who want to compete at the highest level 
and are giving themselves the best chances to do that. Also understand too, away from the gym and away from the ring, both of these guys are very successful businessmen. I mean very successful. Both of these guys give to charity behind the scenes, right? Kobe, early in his career, owned a European team, right? These guys are not just involved in their sports, in their crafts. They're also involved in their investments, right? Mayweather's not just a fighter. Mayweather's an entrepreneur who's also involved with Mayweather promotions, right? Mayweather is actually involved in the careers of other fighters, world-class fighters, right? So I'm guessing that when Floyd sat down with Kobe and they looked at each other, both of these guys recognized what they saw. Let's just say this meeting went differently, I'm sure, than a meeting between, let's say, Kobe and Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. or Floyd and Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. There's a reason why Kobe and Floyd are still very successful in their mid-30s. But let me close by saying this. No matter how close these guys are or how familiar the guys appear to each other, I doubt Floyd is betting money on the Lakers this year. I'm expecting a car crash at Staples Center. Let's shift gears too and let's talk about Roy Jones Jr. You know, Roy is going to be back in the ring at Cruiserweight later this year against a guy named Bobby Gunn. Now, many people were shaken up here online in the comment section when I said if I were Timothy Bradley, I'd retire from the sport. Retire right now. But I'd put the word out that I'd hop back in the ring for a fight against Floyd Mayweather. In other words... You know, for health reasons, Bradley suffered a concussion after the Provotnikov fight, had slurred speech, right? Brain injury is the kind of injury that can boomerang on you years later, right? For health reasons. Also, just for boxing reasons, you're a champion. These sanctioning bodies every few months are going to say, here's a new young lion, some new mandatory contender that wants your title and you need to fight him or you're going to be stripped. And of course, who are these contenders? Folks, they're the hungriest guys in boxing. Many of these guys have toiled for years to get to this spot, right? They haven't tasted the penthouse life. They haven't had the belt around their waist. They're looking at the champ at a press conference and they're thinking, this guy just doesn't know who he's about to fight. Right. These are the hungry guys who literally have been, you know, dreaming of being a champion. They're out there at 147 pounds. If I'm Timothy Bradley, after the career I've had, after the legacy I have built, after what I've accomplished, victories over... Devin Alexander, for example, when Devin Alexander was unbeaten, a victory over Manny Pacquiao. I understand it's debated. Let's be real here, folks. That fight did go the distance. Timothy Bradley, at a minimum, did better than most of Manny Pacquiao's opponents, right? Victory over Juan Manuel Marquez, Hall of Fame career. If I'm Bradley, I'd only be interested in fights that would enhance my legacy, right? In my opinion, there's really one that stands out, and that's a fight against Floyd Mayweather. Everything else has been there, done that. I understand there are credible opponents. Many of you have written me about Keith Thurman. He's dangerous, no doubt about it. But again, you know, Keith Thurman is a guy who's an up-and-comer. The risk-reward doesn't work there. In other words, let's say you're Timothy Bradley and you have a 70% chance of beating even a top contender 
right? Like a Keith Thurman, right? We're talking hypothetically. This is the Bradley point of view. Uh, against big punchers, understand they always have a puncher's chance, right? Thurman would clearly have a puncher's chance. Well, understand if you have a 70% chance of beating a major contender, and if you fight two times, you have a roughly 50% chance of winning both of those fights, right? I'll throw that out there for the statisticians. It's 7 over 10 times 7 over 10, 49 over 100. You have a less than 50% chance of winning both fights. Why take that risk with your legacy? Right? One loss changes your legacy. I was raised in a household where my dad literally would not allow us to watch Rocky Marciano knocking out Joe Lewis. Just food for thought. Right? So if I'm Bradley, I retire because I understand that as great as my legacy is, it could take a hit if I continue fighting and get beaten even by a hungry fighter. Let's talk about Roy Jones. Had Roy Jones walked away from the sport after he won the heavyweight title, Roy Jones would be viewed as one of the greatest fighters of all time. We'd be talking about Ray Robinson and Roy Jones, right? If you were alive in the 1990s, you understood who owned that decade. Roy Jones's run is perhaps the best run I have ever seen a fighter have, right? He was dominant. He fought Vinny Pazienza, now Vinny Paz. At the time, Paz was highly regarded. And Jones was so dominant that I believe there's a round there and keep in mind, Pazienza was not a wallflower. He came in to throw punches. There's a round there where I believe, according to CompuBox, Pazienza lands no punches, right? Jones was dominant. He beats James Tony when James Tony's unbeaten. He beats Bernard Hopkins. Understand, there's no rematch between those two in the 1990s, right? He beats Bernard Hopkins. He beats Virgil Hill. He beats Mike McCallum, right? Understand he is literally on a, on a mission. Even his loss enhanced his career. He has Montel Griffin on the canvas. He hits Montel while he's down on the canvas, while he has a knee on the canvas. He then got disqualified. That was his loss, right? He gains weight. He decides he wants the heavyweight championship. He wins the heavyweight championship. Had he retired, he'd be on boxing's Mount Rushmore, right? As we talk about Floyd Mayweather today, we'd be comparing him to Ray Robinson and Roy Jones, right? Understand, Jones was huge. Unfortunately, Roy Jones kept on fighting. Folks, he's still fighting. After the Ruiz fight, he fights Antonio Tarver. Now, let's be real here. In my opinion, Tarver's a Hall of Famer. Look at Tarver's career. Well, he beats Tarver, at least according to the judges. Now, my point is simply this. The fight was close by everyone's estimation. At that point, Roy Jones should have stepped away from the sport. That was the warning, right? The contenders were catching up to him, right? In gaining weight to be a heavyweight, when he lost the weight, he had lost something. I believe Lennox Lewis was in a similar situation where Lewis was in the ring with Vitaly Klitschko, understood he was in a huge fight, lucked out, because Vitaly got cut, right? Lewis hit him and opened up the cut. I'm not saying, you know, this just happened while Lewis was standing there. Lewis contributed to Vitaly's problems. But the point is simply, Lewis was wise enough to realize it was time to leave the sport. That whatever money, and it was substantial, they were throwing at him for a Vitaly rematch, 
he understood, hey, I'm going to leave with my legacy. These tens of millions of dollars won't compensate me for my legacy. Right? Lewis understood there was a risk of a Marciano Lewis moment. A Marciano Lewis ending to his career. Well, unfortunately, Roy Jones continued on. While we consider Roy Jones today to be a Hall of Famer, he might not be on Mount Rushmore anymore. In fact, it's even worse than that. Guys he fought and beat in his prime, Bernard Hopkins, have eclipsed him. By staying in the game, Jones not only increased his health risks, and who wasn't worried for Roy's health, after Dennis Lebedev knocked him out and Roy was out cold in Russia. Who wasn't worried for his health? Roy has not only increased his health risk by continuing to fight, but he's also decreased his legacy. Roy used to have a cutout. Y'all must have forgot. I'm just telling you, a lot of these young people don't even know who Roy Jones was in the 1990s. Well, Timothy Bradley right now, and I'm not saying Bradley was as big as Roy Jones, but Timothy Bradley right now has put together an obvious Hall of Fame career. He's at the point now where there are very few fights that could enhance his legacy that are worth risking his legacy on. I can really only think of one, and that's Floyd Mayweather. Understand, Devin Alexander, a rematch, that'd be spirited. Manny Pacquiao, a rematch, that'd be spirited. But again, Bradley already has officially W's in both of those fights, right? Let history argue over those fights. Let me point out, too, that those fights will look different. Certainly the Pacquiao fight will look very different were Bradley to step in the ring and beat Floyd Mayweather. So in my opinion, if I were Bradley, I would look hard at Roy Jones. Do you want to be him? Right? I would talk to people about who Roy was in the 1990s and where he is right now as a fighter. I love Roy as a boxing announcer. I wish he'd just stick to that. I don't see how Bobby Gunn is going to either greatly enhance his bank account or his legacy. I don't see how it's going to help his health. If Timothy Bradley has money in the bank, I know he has a wife he loves. I know he has four kids. He needs to look hard at his family and he needs to ask himself, do I need to be continuing to get hit in the head in my 30s? Right? Where I am, I'd back away from the sport. I'd give back the belt. I'd retire a champion or negotiate something where I'm champion emeritus like Vitaly did. This way, the young up-and-coming fighters can fight each other. They've earned the right to fight for titles. You don't want to take that away from them. But as a older fighter, holding on to his legacy and riding off into the sunset, which we're all going to have to do eventually, in my opinion, it's not worth it for Timothy Bradley to fight the hungry lions right now. You've been there, you've done that, you're unbeaten, you have the belt. I believe we're at the stage where he should relinquish the title and then literally be where David Hay was before his comeback. Retired, but telling the press and letting everyone in the sport know, if a Klitschko is willing to fight me, I'll get back in the ring for that fight. If I'm Timothy Bradley, I hop out of the ring and I say, if Floyd is willing to fight me, I'll hop back in the ring for that fight, right? Fighters, a lot of them keep in great shape after they retire. Ray Leonard, right? Great shape. They hang around the gym. They have a certain pride in who they are and in being in shape. 
right? Timothy Bradley is driven just like Floyd is driven, just like Kobe is driven, right? Timothy Bradley, no doubt, would stay in shape in the hopes of getting a Floyd Mayweather fight, but he wouldn't be getting hit in the head while he did so, right? To me, this Roy Jones, Bobby Gunn fight, I just have to scratch my head. Why would a great fighter, a Hall of Fame fighter, still be fighting after the tread has come off the tires? It's a mystery to me. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. Thanks for stopping by.